from the film. I could see the people along the side of the road. I'm just talking here with Gene DeHaven, in case you've just joined it, and with Bob Wakefield, the author of the book, Trail of the Jackasses. And it's the story of the 20 mule team, 5,000 miles, 12 states, and up into Canada. I don't think we could do anything better than just roll some of the film. Let me tell you, the film is black and white, and it's, uh, now Bob, you took this, didn't you? Just with your yeah, camera. Yeah. So I understand if you can lighten up that monitor a little for us, uh, Joe, so that we could see it. Now, this is when you got started, is it? Well, we're, uh, we're at the Goose Egg Ranch here, Jack, in uh, Wyoming. And uh, this is a typical early morning. I, I think it's fairly dark, but this about is about 4.15, Bob. About 4.15. Yeah, right. Now, listen, what time of day did you start your, uh, when you were out on a trip? Well, we'd get up about 4 o'clock in the morning. The cookie was the first one up, and old cookie, as we called him, Lee Ross the Coon. You didn't stop at the local McDonald's and eat them. You cooked your own in the way. Oh, you bet, uh, Jack. We, as I say, we tried to keep this realistic. We cooked over an open fire every morning, every night. Uh, the boys were digging out the pans out of the wagons. I might add that this back wagon was always uh, loaded with about eight, 9,000 pounds, and this front wagon would weigh from eighteen to 20,000 loaded. Now here's the boys greasing, as I mentioned earlier. We took those wheels off of those wagons 3,000 times in this trip, and that was the uh, first thing we did early in the morning, and again at noon. Gene, those are the original old uh, wooden wagon wheels. You bet they are. They, yeah. These wheels are 100 years old. And how did they maintain their uh, strength? I well, think they'd dry rot maybe if it hadn't been used. Well, they had been dry rotted, Jack, but uh, we kind of uh, learned to be blacksmiths. We shrunk the rims and, and tightened them spokes and soaked them, and we kind of put the wagons back in shape before we started, but we had to keep oh. doing this every day. Well, now, <laughs> now, that was not a wagon wheel. It was nearly our, nearly our clock. If somebody heard it at home, uh, let's go back to 66. Now, you started, you told me the story of flipping your old supposed skinner up into the air. Where was your first trip after you really got them going? Well, uh, it all started there, Jack. I loaded everything up in a truck. And we hit, hit California with 25 mules and eight horses. This is an interesting thing here. You back, this is a picket mm -hmm. line. The way the cavalry used to pick it. And we'd screw these iron stakes in the ground and then picket all these animals. And then that whole trip, these animals were tied there all the time and were only turned loose for two days during the uh, entire 5,000 miles. Is that right? But we loaded everything in the truck and hauled it to Death Valley, California. We spent 23 days out on Death Valley, uh, getting the mules climbed ourselves, trying to teach them something and learn something ourselves. And then we sent the trucks home and we started our trip to uh, Washington, South Dakota, which is my home. Where's your home? Washington, South oh. Dakota. This is a 2,000 miles. Well, how long did it take you to go across the uh, desert? Well, the Death Valley in the desert. We there. spent 23 days on the desert practicing and then uh, five actual days of crossing the desert. Isn't that pretty tough? Uh, yes, it, uh, it had its hot moments, so you freeze at night and cook in the daytime. And that first day we rode 14 miles and I don't think that uh, any time in my life I ever rode a 14 miles that seemed like 140. I bet. Well, now, when you got out of the desert and you headed back up home into South Dakota, uh, you must have been driving the regular roads. Uh, we took everything we could, Jack. Uh, the states were all very cooperative. Uh, you know, today, all your old uh, pioneer trails, they were the greatest engineers in the world because the exact trails that those pioneers took across this country our, our major highways today. And when they crossed it this way, they certainly found the easiest way in a mm -hmm. quick time. Interruption, there, there was the wagon. I don't know if we'd seen the other one, the water wagon. Wasn't that the, the, the first one? Right. And you put, pulled the two of them together in tandem. We had them in tandem in the water wagon. We carried 1,248 gallons, and uh, it, the wagon itself weighed a little over 7,000 pounds empty. And of course, loaded with the other uh, supplies we carried on it, it would usually run around 20,000 pounds. Well, two things. How do you keep it from sinking in the sand of the desert? And second, uh, how do you break it going down some of those mountains? <laughs> Jack, that was our major concern, and we did get stuck. And, uh, well, that's a beard you got there, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's just Excuse start, me. Cool, man. Yeah. And this is kind of uh, just before we leave in the morning. We usually had a crowd of people. We're on this famous old Goose Egg Ranch, and there's my son. 
Looks like he's enjoying himself. I think so. Listen, I interrupted myself on the two questions, from sinking in and from breaking. Uh, well, the sinking, uh, it's quite a thing that gets stuck. Uh, we could probably pull 100,000 pounds with these mules, and there was a time or two in the desert we buried them wagons, and we'd just have to swing the mules as far one way as we could. They're on a hundred foot chain, and then we'd start them back at a right angle at a run, and when they hit the other end, something had to give. And until they learned to pull good, it was usually our harness. We'd spend more time fixing harness. And, uh -huh. But uh, one night we got stuck, and it took seven swings before we got out. And Did you lose any of the animals? Well, uh, I lost two animals, Jack. And that's all? Uh, yes. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's good. The animals... Uh uh, the animals then haven't lost anything after all these years. It's just the men that have forgotten how to do the work, huh? Yes, and we, uh, Jack, it was so extensive. Uh, now, you see that cord by that guy putting on his can opener? Uh-huh. That's, uh, well, you can't. Here's a uh, view just from the uh, seat. This is what it looked like if you were sitting up there in the seat driving them. And it's 100 feet from where you're sitting up to that lead mule. And we drove that whole... A uh, string of mules with one line that wasn't any bigger than one in this cigarette. Is that right? Hooked to one mule. I it, bet you had a lot of uh, interest, a lot of curiosity from people would see you going down the road. Oh, man. Uh, nobody drove by us that didn't stop. Yeah, like, if they did, that. we thought something was the matter with you. Well, now, after you got back up to South Dakota, there was your 23-day trip, but you uh, also made another little trip after that. Where'd you go? Well, we left. Uh, we went it in in South Dakota, and... Took on a new crew. The other crew I had was the first trip, which was by far the best crew. They scattered the four winds, and so we decided to cross the east. And believe me, I was kind of scared of that. And we went up to Montreal, Canada, Expo 67. We just put another 3,000 miles on the road. How long did it take you to go from South Dakota up to Montreal? Uh, I think it was 157 days, Bob. Something like that, yeah. Long, long, long trip. Uh, did you... Sleeping bags, you camped out all the way? Yes, uh, we slept on the ground. Uh, we pitched a tent every night and every morning, and then after I got to Beloit, Wisconsin, of course, I know uh, here's my big sister's swing, I believe, coming into the yeah, airport. Yeah, yeah, turning in. Mm -hmm. As you notice, we drive just that one mule in the front, and we try to make the rest of them follow. This is called a jerk line. Well, they're doing pretty good here, but when we first started, we called out the telephone line because a lot of times we get the busy signal and we might end up in the tree or the post <laughs> or the picnic bench. Did you have any trouble getting through customs going into Canada? Well, uh, not any more than anybody else would that tried to drive 22 jack after the customs. Yeah, that's what I mean. Huh? <laughs> they don't even want you to take a dog in there, usually. Here we are, uh, now where? We, uh, this is right up the line here. This is old Fort Cass, isn't it, Bob? Yeah, right. I think a lot of the folks at home today will recognize that because we've got some friends up in Casper that are watching. You know, uh, well, that's kind of hard to see it there in the picture. Uh, we're dragging rough locks on the back of the wheels now. Uh, this was a means we used coming over the mountains. We'd put these big timbers under these wheels for brakes. This was a very impressive sight. Well, I'll tell you, these kids are good. Those are the troopers from Casper, Wyoming, in my opinion, and I guess the opinion of a lot of judges, too. That's the best drum and bugle corps in the whole United States. They are just great. And they were out there to meet you. What was the reaction in the animals when they started? Well, uh, there's one thing we learned a long ways back in this trail. is the new years, they go with their head down, they plot along. Everything's all right, but when the new years go up, you want to look out, because something's going to happen. Well, believe me, when the drums started to beat, and the wind started to blow, the mules went up. And, uh, I don't think the mules really appreciated it as well as we did. That's still got to be pretty thrilling. Bob, where did you join the, uh, the train? In Rollins, uh, just for a quick weekend to get uh, the feel. Uh, actually, I was covering it as a news assignment. Where were you working at the time? At uh, K2 TV in Casper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I followed them. Through until Casper, and then you and I got to talking, and it was so intriguing to see this site that you just don't see in your lifetime. But I thought, why shouldn't someone chronicle this in a book? We talked about it, and we came up with our book. In fact, Jack was just about as bad as everybody else. We actually had to make him go home. Yeah, I think if I had a chance, I'd stay with you too for a long, long time. 
The uh, wives of the fellows on the trip, you didn't have any women with you, did you? Uh, no, uh, I thought I had enough troubles. Uh, I didn't want to start out with being a married man and five children. I didn't want to take that responsibility on, but I did, Jack Lee, at uh, Beloit, Wisconsin, have my wife and my four daughters uh, join me along with my son. And uh, she did all the cooking, cleaned the clothes, and uh, did a million other uh, chores. In fact, I found one thing out that uh, a man was real lucky crossing the United States because the women the best way across the crew. When you uh, traveled through these towns, did you, uh, did the people know you were coming? Were they aware ahead of time? Were there receptions or any programs? Uh, Jack, uh, after we got to Roland, uh, the publicity preceded us. Uh, there wasn't a way in the world you could have kept it quiet. And uh, maybe I'll interrupt you. Uh, Somebody's going to give you an award right now, I believe. Well, that's Jerry Hansen. He was manager of the Casper Chamber at that time, and he's given Gene the deed to a square foot of land on Casper Mountain. So uh, you can almost a Wyoming citizen. We come up and visit your ranch sometime. Well, that's fine. I'm going to put it on it. What was that? <laughs> What were some of the uh, uh, programs or some of the things that were planned as you pulled that 20 mule team in through the town? Uh, we never really knew, but we had parades, we led parades, uh, and just receptions of almost every kind, Jack. I think one of the uh, most outstanding receptions was kind of backfired on the town was when we come into Edmonton, Pennsylvania, in one of the third roughest hills in the United States, uh, real tough. I know it gave me a knot in the pit of my stomach when I looked at it. There's Superman getting on my horse. Yeah. And everybody for weeks were wondering what we were going to do with that hill. And of course, after crossing all these mountains in the United States, I wasn't worried about any hill in Pennsylvania until I saw it. And the mayor of the town and the council came out and wanted to know if we'd stop in their town at 12 o'clock. We were going through their town and camping four miles farther out. And so they uh, looked off an area and asked me if uh, we'd be nice enough to pull in and stop. They had gifts for us. They put banners across the street. We were to come through at 12 o'clock, and at 11 o'clock, this town completely jammed with people. They called in five extra traffic police. And when we pulled in, the mayor and the councilman, they ran out alongside, and they threw us gifts. And they said, Mr. DeHaven, would you mind if you just kept going? He says, this town is so jammed, we've got to clear it out. We'll <laughs> throw something might up. And of course, I had one say, but Mr., there's only one guy that'd like to get out of here more than you want me to <laughs> speak, which I did. I might uh, interrupt you. These receptions, like you're seeing here in Casper, were typical all across the country. I joined Gene again in Rochester, Minnesota, and took over his manuscript for the first half of the book. And it was the same. Through Rochester, uh, just every place you went. Every place you went, guys would hire airplanes to go out and get aerial shots as the train approached their town, and then this shot would appear on the front page of the paper. Well, there just aren't too many 20 mule teams around anymore. The story of this 5,000-mile journey behind all those animals is called the Trail of the Jackasses. And that's what we're talking about today with the author and with the man whose idea started the whole thing. We'll do more of it in just a minute. Well, we've seen the film now. Bob Wakefield, the author of the book, shot that film just kind of with a home camera. And as he said, amateur night. But uh, I thought it was pretty good. Bob, it, kind of, it gave me an idea of what that whole trip was like, except it never did really just hear what a normal day would be. So now Mrs. Jones is going to tell her husband tonight what it's like to go out on that 20 mule train trip. What would a normal day be? Well, you'd start out early in the morning, Jack, and... Uh it wasn't many days I went over a 20-foot bank with a horse and lit on my back and got put in the hospital. And then my son got bucked off, and we put him in the hospital, so they called us up and told him to come get him. They thought they'd kill a nurse with a wheelchair. Uh, we had another man, a horse fell and rolled on him, and he had his leg operated on three times. And We Where? tipped over in Arizona. We had, the wagon tipped? Yes, we tipped over. And, had 19 men quit. Uh, we rode 32 straight days in rain at one time, and we had tornadoes carry tents away twice, and both times we had men in them. Uh, we had runaways, uh, and when they run away, you couldn't stop them. And then my wife joined me and got to playing poker with a trucker, and of course the trucker was bigger than the car she was driving, and didn't hurt her, thank the Lord. 
And my daughter got kicked by a horse and put in the hospital. And as I say, we rode in the rain, we slept in it, we cooked in it. Uh, it was just a nice normal weekend but, that wasn't yeah, much happening. Outside happened, of this, huh? nothing really exciting <laughs> really ever happened on the trip. <laughs> Where did you camp at night? Did you have to plan ahead, uh, get permission, places to camp? That was a big problem, but uh, the farther we went, uh, people uh, pretty soon had got to the point where we were met days ahead, weeks ahead. Uh, towns wanted us to pull out of the way into their towns, and they they just give us free oats and free hay and places to camp clear across the country. Hmm. And I might say this is interesting, Jack. It was to me, you hear so much about the friendliness of the West and uh, not of the East. I found from California clear across the entire United States there was absolutely no difference in the people. And maybe it's because it was so unusual in the East that you absolutely couldn't have beat the friendliness or the hospitality of the people in the East and the way they treated them. When you left San, uh, uh, South Dakota, you went up, I know you said, through Rochester, Minnesota, and then you mentioned Beloit, Wisconsin, so apparently you went around the south end of Lake Michigan. What was your route? What towns and what areas did you travel through? Well, we crossed Wisconsin, and then, of course, we went right through uh, Chicago Heights, Joliet. This was probably uh, the thing we worried about the most, was going around that south side of Chicago. You weren't out on the Skyline Expressway or any of those. Why no, did you get uh, through the city? Well, we went right through it. There's only one way we could go, and I, they were having trouble with their interstates then. And I was kind of thinking of going up on this uh, Eisenhower Expressway, but I didn't know if old Daly had let me do that or not. But it's been kind of hard to turn around and get back off. Yeah, I don't believe you would have been too <laughs> welcome, though, without them knowing about it. So how did, you went just on the city streets? Uh, well, yes. We, uh, did you have police escorts? Oh, you bet. Yeah. We had police escort. This was kind of why we had to have so many cowboys, too, was we carried a flag man 100 yards ahead of us and 100 yards behind us to flag traffic. Uh, some of our biggest problems going through there were some of these metal draw bridges and things like this, and mules didn't uh, like oh, them Oh, that's well. right. Some of those uh, bridges uh, don't have a solid uh, cement floor on them. They've got open uh, grating, too. Yeah, and those steel shoes, they get to clatter, and them wagon wheels get to creaking, uh -huh. and uh, those uh, mules get a little excited. Where else did you go then, around through Chicago? and Went through uh, Chicago and... Kind of went straight east through Walkerton, Indiana, Warsaw, Fort Wayne, uh, then on up through uh, Pennsylvania, or through Ohio, yeah. Bryan, uh, Bowling Green, uh, and believe me, this thing's 150 feet long. Some of them intersections we had to turn, they weren't made for. Well, when I come back here in a minute, I want to find out how much money you spent. I want to find out what it was like in Montreal when you got to the fair and I want to know what you're going to do next. And those are the questions we'll talk with Gene about after this time. What response did you get in Montreal when you went into Expo? Uh, very good, Jack. Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't know there were many TV cameras. We had mm -hmm. the cops who sat down beside us. And, uh, you were kind of a feature of the fair, though. Well, we got our chairs, and... You know, uh, we were the only animals that were allowed to cross the bridge crossing the St. Lawrence Seaway. They turned back uh, people that rode horses 5,000 miles, uh, drove buggies. They trucked two boys that drove ponies across. We were the only outfit that they've ever let drive across one of these big toll bridges. Hmm. Of course, they didn't charge us when we went through the toll bridge. Yeah. How much did you spend on this whole trip? Let's assume that uh, Mrs. Jones says, well, hubby, this is a good idea. Why don't you take one of those trips? Well, uh, I'm still paying for it. Probably it'll take me 10 years. I figure uh, the loss of time, and I quit a, a very highly paid profession, I figure approximately somewhere around 250, 253,000. Is that right? What I lost and what I spent. Somewhere around a quarter of a million dollars for that trip. Oh, I just don't believe we ought to try that this weekend. One of the reasons I admire Gene so much is because he didn't sell out to commercial interests. All this money he spent was his own. He didn't take on Well, it. you weren't sponsored by some company then. No. Uh, I had several opportunities, Jack. Uh, we had so many people, so many kids, you can't imagine uh, the people from all walks of life that came out. And the greatest reward is uh, 
today uh, I can probably claim a million friends across the United States, and I, I just kind of, it seemed, uh, it grew on you. It felt like you was doing something without a dollar bill being attached to it, and I know uh, a lot of people say I'm awful stupid for this. Uh, but I firmly believe that you got one life to live, and if I eventually get out of debt, uh, I feel that I'm well rewarded. Gene, if you were going to take that trip again tomorrow, now let's assume that you were going to start it all again. I'd call you first. And you, <laughs> you'd better. You'd better. I'll go. But if you were going to start it tomorrow and you knew that you couldn't take that whole trip, you could just only have one portion of it where you'd spend your whole time, where would you go? Uh, Jack, I, this might surprise a lot of them. I'd have to go back to Death Valley. Exactly. I, I think that was uh, one of the greatest experiences because it was tough, it was hot, it was dirty. Uh, it really gave you a, quite a pioneer feeling to cross it. No people. No people. That, uh, I have nothing against people, but after two years and camping overnight and answering the same question night after night and a million times, uh, all of a sudden it's real nice to get the solitude of no one. Bob, the book, The Trail of the Jackasses, is, uh, is an obvious title. Do you have any trouble with that title? Well, uh, my first indication that there was going to be any trouble, uh, I, first of all, it's my first book, and I thought, here's a family story. Gene came up with the title, and I was at an autograph party once, and a fella wouldn't announce the title over the PA system because of the word jackasses. And I got to thinking, how ridiculous. And then we find out... He had to be a city boy from hmm. someplace way back. Then, then I find out that a major bookstore in Minneapolis refuses to carry the book because of the title. Is there and yet, in the same bookstore are the, the major best sellers with a lot uh, less uh, family appeal than Trail of the Jackasses. So I'm... Well, the stores, here, the stores here in Denver are carrying it, Oh, yes. They? All yeah. the major bookstores yeah. have the book, and it's the Chronicle. But I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't carry it just because of the word jackass, for crying out loud, that's been used long before you and I were here, and that word will refer to a mule long after you and I are gone. It certainly does. You know, I've, uh, I've run into a few of these. It certainly does seem funny. Uh, uh, seems like appropriate title. Well, it tells me what the story's about, and it's one that I have enjoyed reading, and you did a nice job with your first book. Thank you. Because, I, I, as I say, I got the wanderlust from it right off of that. Well, Gene, we're running just a little bit out of time here, but I suppose everyone would like to know when, where, and what is next. Uh, well, Jack, I went back into uh, the auction business. Uh, my father always said you had to be crazy to be an auctioneer, and I guess maybe this proves it. I don't know. Uh, Leroy Van Dyke did all right with his... <laughs> his song, The Auctioneer, maybe that's uh, the way to make money. You know, I might add that uh, I spent a little time with uh, Leroy Van Dyke. I sang the song many times myself, and I've made several appearances with him. He's going to be out four seasons here, another uh, two or three, four weeks. I don't remember just the date. But now I interrupted you. What are you going to do? Well, I uh, recently went in partnership uh, in another auction barn back home, and which has been my lifelong business. Uh, trying to get back in the ranch and uh, uh, of course I'm going from here I have several appearances to make in California and Palm Springs this Saturday night and things like this uh, which we're hoping maybe can help promote our book but uh, believe me uh, I uh, kind of feel like wrestler but I haven't got cooked up anything yet it took several years 5,000 miles Twelve states, two countries, and a 20-mule team. Gene DeHaven was the man who got the idea and made it all work. Bob Wakefield is the man who wrote it all down and put it in the book called The Trail of the Jackasses so that you and I can travel along with him over those miles. Men, thank you very much. It's just kind of a relaxed, easy show today because I just may pack my suitcase, put my boots on tomorrow, and head off someplace to find an old dusty mule. Thanks for coming by. Good luck. Thank you, Thank Jack. Thank you, Jack. We'll be watching again for the book.